bison one day. We're going to read some more Valley of the Dolls. It is getting heated up. We've got to the next section already. Um, they're doing that construction across the hall, so we're going to do the best that we can. They've been a little loud. I asked them if they could keep it down some, but they give you the attitude, but we'll, we'll do what we can. This is my shout out still as my fan. It makes just the right kind of white, white noise for me to sleep with. And it gets just enough air circulating, not too much. The big fans are just too loud and rattly and they blow all the dust around. And this is my product placement, it's my barrettes. And I can put it in my hair and snap it shut and off I go, especially if the windy if it's a windy day. But that's the isn't that clever? Sometimes it's the simplest things that mean so much and can change your life. So that's my barrette. So let's just dig right in. There's a little lull in the construction. I hope it doesn't get worse <laughs> than hell. Anyway, we are up to page 184, and we are up to the next section, which is called Jennifer. So we're going to find all about Jennifer today. December 1945. Hit the sky. Had three performances to go in Philadelphia. Henry's predictions had been correct. They were able to eliminate Boston and bring the show into New York earlier than planned. The cast was eager for the New York opening, confident they had a hit, but the tension was high. New York critics were unpredictable. Nothing could be taken for granted. Jennifer was oblivious to the pre-opening hysteria. Philadelphia had been a most profitable engagement. She stood in the lobby of her hotel and flashed one of her glorious smiles at the persistent Philadelphia lawyer who was pleading for one last nightcap. It's three o'clock, she begged, and I must get some sleep. You can sleep all day tomorrow. Come on, I know a wonderful after-hours club. It's right up the street. It's cold, and I want to get some sleep. Robbie, honestly. Besides, I don't drink, and if I have one more Coke, I'll explode. How can you be cold in that coat? He looked meaningfully at the new beaver she was wearing. She patted it affectionately. You were an angel to give it to me. It's really warmer than my mink, but I've got to get some sleep. Let me come up with you, he begged. You were with me last night, Robbie. Is there a rule about two nights? Yes, when I'm working, call me tomorrow. Her smile was promising. What time? Around six. We'll have dinner before the show. After that? After that, she nodded. She blew him a kiss and stepped into the elevator. There were some messages lying on the floor under her door. One was from a columnist. There were two requests to call operator 24 in Cleveland when it was too late to call her mother. She looked at the time on the last Cleveland message, 1.30. Even her mother wouldn't have the tenacity to wait this long for a return call. There was also a message from Ann. She had signed the lease for the apartment she had found, and everything was fine. Ann was a wonderful girl. Jennifer envied her the way she felt about Leon. It must be great to be able to feel that way. But then if you did, you couldn't do the other. She stroked the beaver coat. One night with Robbie, that's what a great body was for, to get things you wanted. She wondered what it would be like to really to care to love someone like Leon Burke. Leon would be easy to love, she had thought about it when they first met. We'll catch Tony Poehler's opening tonight, Henry had said. You must be seen around to keep the publicity going. I've arranged for Leon Burke to escort you. I'm taking Helen. She had been up unprepared for someone like Leon. She had felt a surge of excitement in meeting a man she knew she wanted, a man she wanted for nothing beyond her own pleasure. She had intended to have him that night, then Tony Poehler had materialized. It had been a tense moment of decision. The spotlight on Tony, Tony singing to her, everyone in the room staring, keeping her smile frozen in place, feeling the magnetism of Liam Burke, yet aware of the public, public embrace Tony Poehler was offering. As a man, Tony could not compare with Leon. They were the same age. Always, she imagined, but around 30, but one would always be a boy while the other had long been a man. But Liam Burke was only an agent. Tony was a star. That, that had made her decision. It was that simple. She got undressed, dropping her clothes carelessly on the chair. Maybe she would let Robbie stay tomorrow night. She could do with a new evening gown. 
She wrinkled her nose. He was so unattractive, and he breathed so hard, but she needed some clothes, and many looked like Robbie were always generous. They had to be. Now Leon Burke, but he was a luxury she couldn't afford. Some unknown, some unknown mechanism seemed to click within her mind, automatically eliminating the empirical with the precision of an IBM machine, acting as a nerve to block her emotions when they might complicate her decisions. It hadn't always been like this. In the beginning, her emotions had fought back, but that was long ago. Now the decision came automatically. She thought of Leon Burke again. Too bad. The timing's been unfortunate that night. That night it had been had to be Leon or Tony, and there had been no contest. Leon had seemed to understand. She was suddenly struck by a new thought. We're alike. Of course that had to be the answer. She was a luxury he couldn't afford, but Anne, certainly Anne, could have fit into his scheme of things. A new and foreign thought struck her. Perhaps she just hadn't appealed to Leon. But that was ridiculous. She appealed to every man. She dropped her bra and pants to the floor and stood before the full-length mirror. She surveyed her body with a clinical interest. It was perfect. She turned sideways and examined the profile of her breast. They were as upright as ever. She folded her arms and methodically did 25 breast tightening exercises. She, uh, <laughs> she opened the medicine cabinet and took out a large jar. She took out a large jar of cocoa butter. With almost surgical precision, she massaged the butter into her breast with gentle but firm upward strokes. Then, with equal care, she creamed the makeup off her face. Once this was accomplished, she opened another jar and put some cream under her eyes. She took a V-shaped plaster out of a box and pasted it between her eyes. On the bridge of her nose, she did 25 more breast exercises and slid into a nightgown. She looked at the clock. Good Lord, it was almost four and she still wasn't sleepy. When did they turn the heat on in this hotel? It was freezing. She got on the covers and glanced through the morning papers. There were two pictures of her. One was a wire service photo showing her with Tony. Tony, he'd have asked her to marry him by now if he weren't for that sister of his. She frowned as she thought about Miriam. The frowny plaster stabbed a warning. She relaxed her face instantly that, what was she going to do about Miriam? They could never shake her. If it wasn't that Tony was so eager to go to bed with her, she'd never see him alone. Come to think of it, that was the only time they did get rid of Miriam. The phone rang timidly as if frightened to interrupt anyone at such an hour. She picked it up hopefully. Sometimes Tony stayed up till dawn, too, but it was the Cleveland operator. She sighed and accepted the reverse charge call. Jen, it was her mother's whining voice. I've been trying to get you all night. I just got in, Mother. I thought it was too late to call you back. How could I sleep? I'm so upset. There was a big story about you in the Cleveland papers. Said you didn't get a cent out of your annulment from the prince. That's right. Jen, are you crazy? You know John is going to be retired next year and we'll never be able to live on his pension. As it is, we can't make ends meet. I sent you $50 last week, Mother, and I'll send 50 more as soon as I get my paycheck this week. I know, but Gran's been sick. I had to take her to the doctor, and then we had a bad leak with the oil burner, and I'll see if I can dig up some more, Mother, she thought of Robbie again. But I only make 125 in the show, less Social Security and income tax. Jen, I didn't starve and do without to send you to school in Switzerland, just so you'd wind up as a showgirl making that kind of money. You never starved, Mother. It was money Daddy left me. And you only sent me to Switzerland for that year to break me up with Harry because I was determined you weren't going to wind up as a poor little Jeanette Johnson marrying a garbage garage mechanic. Harry was not just a garage mechanic. He was a studying to be an engineer, and I loved him. Well, he's still a mechanic with black fingernails and three grimy kids. Harry and Irons was once one of the prettiest girls around. She's your age but looks 40 now, married to him. Mother, how can a girl 25 look 40? When a girl has no money and marries for love, she ages real fast. Love doesn't last. Men only care about one thing. Remember your father? 
Mother, this is long distance, Jennifer said wearily. You didn't call me just to complain about Daddy. Besides, John's been a wonderful husband to you. I don't even remember Daddy, but I'm sure he couldn't have been as nice as John. He was a louse, your father, rich, handsome, and a louse. But I loved him. Our family never had money. But we had a name. Don't forget, Gran is a Virginia Tremont. I still think you should have taken Tremont as your stage name instead of that ridiculous North. Didn't we agree that I was to take a stage name so no one could trace me? If I'm to pass as 19, I have to be Jennifer North. If I took Tremont, someone in Virginia would trace me. If I took Johnson, everyone in Cleveland would remember me. With your publicity, they all remembered you. The whole town's been talking about you since you eloped. One paper snipped about your claiming to be only 19, but they were all so impressed with the prince. Hey, how are you, lunatic friend? They were all so impressed with the prince that it didn't matter. And I felt it didn't matter because you were safely married. Now you go and throw it all away without collecting a penny. Mother, why do you think I ran? Just before we were to go to Italy, I found out he had no money. What do you mean? I saw the pictures in the papers, the diamond necklace, the mink coat. The necklace belongs to his family. He bought me the mink, but I think he got it free for publicity that we gave to the furrier. He had a whole floor at the Waldorf, but a wine company was footing the bill. He was like a goodwill ambassador for them. His title is legitimate. Very royal, but he hasn't a dime. They lost everything when Mussolini took over. They have some horrible big castle outside of Naples. I could live there, scrounging among the international set, wearing the family jewels, living in a genteel poverty. I was lucky I found out in time. He told me he was rich because he thought a beautiful American wife would be an asset over there. After we were married, I learned the bitter facts. Then he started telling me some of the rich Italian wine merchants. I had to play up to go all the way if the guy wanted me. Mother, he was a high-class pimp. When you get down to it, I was lucky to be able to get the mink coat. What? What about this Tony Polar? her mother asked. He's real cute. Jen, mother, he is cute, and I like him, and he also happens to have a lot of money. Besides, my lawyer thinks I may get a movie contract. Forget about pictures. Why? I might make it. It's too late. You're not 19. Look, you're lucky. You have a gorgeous face and the kind of body men go for, though your kind of figure doesn't last. What have you told this Tony Polar about your background? An airtight story, based on some truth, that my father was wealthy and was killed in a bombing in England, and he left everything to his second wife. That's true. What else? That my father had left me a small inheritance, enough to see me through school in Switzerland. Since I'm supposed to be 19, I left about out about staying in Europe for over five years. What did the, What did you tell him about me? I said you were dead. What? Mother, what should I tell him? That I have a mother and a stepfather and a grandmother living in Cleveland who can't wait to move in with us? But if you marry him, how do you explain me? You are my aunt, my mother's dear sister, whom I support. All right, are you watching your weight? I'm very thin, mother. I know, but don't gain and lose. That's the worst thing for your breasts. Big breasts like yours are going to drop soon enough, and then there'll be an eyesore. Make them pay while you have them. <laughs> Men are animals. They seem to like them. Maybe I wouldn't have lost your father if I hadn't been flat-chested. Then I could have had a decent life. She started to sob. Oh, Jen, I can't take it anymore. I want to leave and be with you, baby. Now, Mother, you can't leave John or Gran. Why can't I let John stay with Gran? He and that piddling job of his. Where else could he go? He could never afford to buy a house. Mother, Jennifer clenched her teeth and held on uh, out her patience. Mother, please, let me marry Tony first, then I'll take care of you. Has he mentioned marriage? Not yet. What are you waiting for, Jen? In five years, you'll be 30. I was 29 when your father got tired of me, Jen. You haven't got much time. It's not that simple, Mother. He has a sister. She manages him, writes all his checks. Their mother died when Tony was born. She, she raised him, and she loves him. And she hates me. Jen, you've got to be tough. Get rid of her. Take her place. You can't let her move in with you if you marry him. It would ruin your life. And she'd never let me come. Baby, use your head. Be smart. If a woman has money, nothing can ever hurt her. 
I only want the best for you, baby. The re radiators began to crackle. The sun was sneaking in under the blinds. Jennifer was still awake. Her mother's call had not particularly disturbed her. She was used to it, but she worried about not sleeping. The one way to hold your looks was plenty of rest. Even if you didn't sleep, laying in bed and resting almost was almost as good. She had read that somewhere she lit another cigarette. But what kind of rest was it if you paced around and smoked an entire pack of cigarettes during the night? She walked to the bathroom and put some more cream under her eyes. No lines yet, but long. how long could this go on? She hadn't an average more than three hours of sleep a night since, since those last weeks in Spain. She sighed. Before that, she had always been able to sleep. In fact, she slept. She, uh, in fact, slept. Sleep used to be an escape. When problems began, insurman became insurmountable. She would forward to the night until those weeks in Spain with Maria. Maria. Maria had been the most beautiful girl in school, and Jennifer, along with her other polyglot first termers, had idolized the glacial Spanish beauty. Mother was a senior and spoke to no one. And if she was aware of the hero worship she inspired in the other students, it failed to touch her. She made no friends. The halter only added to her glamour with the younger girls and to the speculation and envy among her contemporaries. It looked as if Maria would graduate and leave Switzerland without allowing anyone to penetrate the imperial barrier until that day in the library. Jennifer was in tears reading a letter from her mother. The money had run out. She was to return home at the end of the term. Had she made a, any valuable contacts? Cleveland was still feeling the depression, although the war in Europe was opening new factories. Harry had married Harriet Irons and still worked in a gas station. It was the part about Harry that had brought the tears. Come, nothing can be that bad, Jennifer looked up. It was Maria, the majestic Maria, talking to her. Maria sat down. Maria was sympathetic. She listened while Jennifer talked. I don't know what my mother expected, Jennifer finished wearily. Maybe she thought the English teacher would be a lord with, the man, with a manner. Maria laughed. Parents, her English was stilted but excellent. I'm 22 and I will be expected to make a marriage with a man of my father's choice. It will be a matter of his land adjoining ours or our mutual family interest. Since our civil war, our country is devastated. It's the duty of the few remaining families in power to unite. I agree with these decisions, but unfortunately, as a woman, I am expected to sleep with this pig. I was in love with Harry, Jennifer said sadly, but he didn't suit my mother. How old are you, Jeanette? Jennifer had been Jeanette then. Nineteen. Have you ever had a man? Jennifer blushed and stared at the floor. No, but Harry and I... We went pretty far. I mean, I let him touch me. And once I touched his, I have, I have gone to bed with a man, Maria started. All the way? But of course. Last summer, I vacationed with, aunt, my, with an aunt in Sweden. I met a beautiful man. He had been in the Olympics. He was working as a swimming instructor. I knew the men my father was considering. It would be a fat German who escaped from the art treasures or one of the Carrillo family. None of the Carrillo boys have chins, so I decided to at least try it for the first time with a beautiful man. I wish I had done it with Harry. Now he's married to another girl. Be glad she did it. It was awful. <laughs> the man, he mouths your breath. He pushes it into you. It hurts. Then he per perspires and breathes heavily like an animal. I bled and I got pregnant. Jennifer couldn't believe this was happening. Maria, the unapproachable school god, is confiding in her. Orin, Maria spat out his name. He took care of things. A doctor, more pain, and goodbye pregnancy. Then I got the fever and was very sick. I was taken to the hospital, the operation. I can never have children. Oh, Maria, I'm so sorry. Maria smiled slyly. No. It is good. I will let my father make all the arrangements he wishes. Then I will tell the man. No man wants to marry a woman who cannot have children. I will never have to marry, she said triumphantly. But what will your father say? Oh, my aunt is taking care of the answer. She had to learn the truth, but it was her responsibility, so she must stand behind me. I shall say I was ill, that I had a tumor in my uterus and I had to, that had to be removed. 
Was it? Maria nodded. Yeah, my uterus was removed. Peritonitis had set in, but it is wonderful. I'm no longer bothered with the motherly, the monthly period. Jennifer wanted to say she was sorry, but she couldn't offer sympathy to a, a girl who regarded the incident as a stroke of marvelous luck. Well, at least you've got everything settled, she said, but I still have to return to Cleveland. You do have to return, Maria. You do not have to return, Maria said emphatically. You're too beautiful to spend your life waiting to be mauled by the first available man. But what can I do? In two weeks, the term is ended. You can come back to Spain with me for the summer. We will think of something. Maria, it was too wonderful, but I have no money, just a return ticket home. You will be my guest. I have more money than I can use. The last two weeks in school have been a personal triumph for Jennifer. The news raced through school. Little Jeanette Johnson had been befriended by Maria. The girls stared in envy. Maria continued to keep her imperial distance, even with Jennifer, except to stop and chat briefly whenever they passed in the hall. The moment they left school, Maria's attitude changed. She became warm and friendly. It began when they took the cab to Luzang. We can't leave for Spain right away. My father's cable. She handed it to Jennifer. It advised Maria to spend the summer in Switzerland. Spain was still feeling the devastation of the war, which one million dead and 700,000 injured. It was impossible to staff the house at present. They had had to close it and were staying at a hotel. But things would soon return to normal. Meanwhile, she was to enjoy herself abroad. He had cabled the number of a Swiss bank account. We have plenty of money, Maria said, enough to travel around the world and back, but the war is on in Europe, so France is out. So are Germany and England. Let's go to America, Jennifer suggested. We could go to New York. I've never been to New York. How? I'm not a citizen. Travel is impossible with Europe at war. You might make it on a Red Cross boat as an American citizen. You would have priority, but there would still be the mines and the submarines. Anyway, I have no desire to go to New York. We shall stay here for the summer. Hitler will win any day, and the whole thing will be over. They were to remain in Switzerland three years. They became lovers at the first night. Although Jennifer had been startled at the proposal, she felt no revulsion. In fact, she was even a little curious. Maria was the ex exalted girl heroine, and Maria... Maria's logical explanation removed any taint of abnormality. We like one another. I want to make you know about sex to feel thrilling climaxes, not let you learn about it by being mauled by some brutal man. We are doing nothing wrong. We're not lesbians like those awful freaks who cut their hair and wear mannish clothes. We're two women who adore one another, who know about being gentle and affectionate. That night, Maria undressed and stood before Jennifer proudly. She had a lovely body, but Jennifer felt a secret delight in the knowledge that her own was superior. She dropped her clothes to the floor shyly. She heard Maria's startled gasp, and she exposed her breast. You're more lovely than I dream, Maria said softly. Her hand stroked Jennifer's breast lightly and eagerly and endearingly. She leaned over and rested her cheek against them. You see, I love your beauty and respect it. A man would be tearing, it at, tat it, tearing into it now. She ran her fingers gently over Jennifer's body. To her amazement, Jennifer began to feel a sensation of excitement. Her body began to vibrate. Come, Maria took her hand. Let us lie down. We will have a cigarette. No, Maria, keep touching me, Jennifer pleaded. Later I will touch you and hold you to your heart's content, but I want you to feel comfortable with me. I will be gentle. Maria had been gentle and very patient taking more liberties each night, slowly teaching Jennifer to respond, erasing any embarrassment. You can't just be loved. You must love back, Maria would insist. Make me thrill as I thrill you. Each night, Maria urged her on until at last Jennifer found herself responding with equal ardor and reaching peaks of exultation. She never dreamed existed. She enjoyed, and she enjoyed a dual relationship Maria, with Maria. At night, she was eager for Maria, demanding and ecstatic. But during the day, she regarded Maria as a friend. She felt no other personal attachment. When they stopped together or exposed, explored strange little towns, Maria was just another girl. She felt no involvement. Often they meet attractive men, ski instructors, students, and Jennifer found these encounters quite difficult. 
Maria remained aloof to their advances, but Jennifer found some of the young men quite appealing. Many times as they danced, she felt her body thrilling to the touch of the strong masculine one that held her close. When a boy whispered an endearment, she found herself longing to respond. Once she had slipped out for a brief walk with a particularly handsome Panamanian boy. He was a medical student and she was going to New York after the war for further studies. He wanted her. They kissed and she found herself clinging to him, responding to his kisses in equal passion. It was wonderful to hold the strong shoulders of a man, to feel a man's chest against her own, the strength of a man's hand after Maria's soft, tender one, the firmness of a man's lips. She wanted this boy desperately, but she tore away from him and returned to the cafe. Maria had noticed her absence and there was a slight scene the night when they were alone. Jennifer swore it had been a headache that she had just wanted some air. At last in bed, Maria relented. But most of the time, it was wonderful. Maria was wildly extravagant. She bought Jennifer beautiful clothes. Jennifer learned to ski. Her French grew fluent and effortless. When they grew bored with Lausanne, they moved to Geneva. After three years in Switzerland, Maria's father wanted her to return, but she refused. Then in 1944, he stopped her checks. She had no choice. You will come with me, she told Jennifer but we will have to cash in your return ticket to America. I have not enough money without it. Jennifer knew she was handing in her ticket to freedom. For the past year, she had grown increasingly wary with Maria's demands on her body. Yet Cleveland and her mother were even less appealing. But Spain, she might find some handsome Spanish man and a good family, of a good family. She was 23, technically still a virgin, why not? Jennifer remained in Spain over a year. She met many eligible men. A few were passable, but Maria kept a hawk-like watch on all her activities. They were always chaperoned by one of Maria's aunts. Maria repelled all advances and saw to it that Jennifer made no progress. Jennifer grew desperate. Maria's possessiveness was stifling. For the first time, she understood her mother's fear of poverty. Money bought freedom. Without it, one could never be free. In Spain, she could live luxuriously and wear beautiful clothes, but she belonged to Maria. If she returned to Cleveland, she faced a different kind of imprisonment, marriage to some third-rate man who would also demand to use her body. Whichever way you looked at it, without money, you were someone's captive, but there had to be a way out. She began laying awake at night. She suffered through Maria's lovemaking, returning an ardor she did not feel, feigning sleep until Maria, even breathing, assured her of safety. Then she would slide out of bed and sit by the window, smoking endlessly, staring at the stars, thinking, money, she had to have money. The answer was in her body. It would work for her. It had carried her this far. She would go to New York, take a different name, lie about her age. Maybe she could model. Somehow she'd get money. She'd never be trapped again. When the atom bomb was dropped, everyone in Madrid was feverish for the news. Even Maria sat breathlessly at the radio set, eagerly listening for bulletins. Jennifer took this opportunity to post a secret letter to her mother, instructing her to write and demand it, and demand Jennifer's presence at home due to illness. Her mother obeyed, and Maria had no choice. They separated with promises of undying devotion Jennifer swearing to return as soon as her mother recovered. She felt a twinge of guilt when Maria pressed a book of traveler's checks in her hand. It comes to $3,000 in American money. Try to save enough for your return here, but if you need more, cable me. I live only for the day of your return. To erase any suspicion, Jennifer left most of her clothes in Spain and further assurance of her return. She had gone directly to New York and checked into a commercial hotel. She sent her mother 500 No circumstances to return, reveal her whereabouts or her new name. In the beginning, Maria wrote every day. Jennifer never answered. Through a strange stroke of luck, she had run into the Panamanian medical student the first day she was in New York. Fortunately, he only recalled that they had met and that they had wanted and that he wanted her. He accepted the new name without question. She went to bed with him every night for three weeks, and then he introduced her to Prince Mar Marala. It was seven o'clock. She crushed out the last cigarette. She had to sleep. She wanted to be really good with Robbie. Then maybe she could get the gown and the money for her mother. 
Okay, we are next to up to the next section at page 200. This section is called Neely. So now we get to learn about Neely. January 1946. The New York critics had been unanimous in their raves for Hit the Sky. Helen Lawson's public adoration had reached new heights and Neely had received several excellent notices, none strong enough to incur Helen's animosity, but glowing enough to, to exceed Neely's wildest expectation. No one had been more surprised than Neely. One critic had actually called her the freshest new talent to come along in many seasons. This accolade, coupled with the new apartment, made her almost believe she was someone. She couldn't get over the luxury of the apartment. Anne was just fabulous. She ran into luck, that girl, and it always seemed to be connected with Alan. Only this time it was Alan's father. Gino had dumped his girlfriend, Adele, who had gotten so mad she had booked herself into the Dorchester Hotel in London as a showgirl. Just before she left, Anne had run into her and gotten her scrupia, scrupia, scrupious apart, scrumptious apartment. Neely kept touching everything, the bedspreads, the lamps. She never dreamed she'd live in a living room that had a white rug. Of course, it was only a sublet. Adele would take it back from them in June 1st. But by then, Jennifer would probably marry Tony. Anne might marry Leon, and she would marry Mel, especially if Mel's new job worked out. What a Christmas present from the blue that was. Johnny Mallon giving him two-week trial as a writer on a radio show. If he made good, they could be rich. Radio writers made as much as 500 a week, Mel said. Even more, Mel was starting at 200 and she was making 200 and the show had come into New York three weeks earlier than planned because they didn't need Boston. Geez, things were just perfect. She was going to buy some fancy clothes, too. After all, everyone has seen the purple taffeta a hundred times. Geez, the way Jennifer came back from Philadelphia with a closet full of clothes. No wonder she was always broke. She said Tony Poehler was tight, but how could she mean that with him giving her that gorgeous big blue ring for Christmas. Jennifer said it was only an aquamarine. Gee, she'd be happy to accept an aqua, aquamarine. Well, for a start, she was going to get a new winter coat. Orbox was having a big sale. She and Mel had been invited to Johnny Mallon's New Year's Eve party, but they'd seen the old year out in Helen's dressing room. You never get out of the theater to a party before 12 o'clock. Ellen had insisted pouring champagne. Johnny's party had been terrific. Neely had never been to a party packed with celebrities, and they all knew her. That was the big surprise. Everyone knew who she was. She couldn't get over it. And then Johnny Mallon had told Mel he couldn't consider himself a permanent member of the team. Jeez, that was great. She had stopped saying she's all the time. Several people had laughed when she said it. Oh, not nasty laughing. They thought she was kidding. But maybe it... Maybe if she mixed with these classy friends of Mel, she'd learn some good expressions. She never heard anything backstage except words she didn't want to say. And Mel had such a good vocabulary, he'd gone to college. Jeez, a college man like Mel, in love with her. She'd never forget that New Year's Eve. Mel said he wouldn't, wouldn't either. She hugged him that night when they reached his hotel. I'm so happy, Mel. I'm scared. This is really starting off in 1946 with a bang, Mel had said as they got ready for bed. But you know, I felt a little sorry for Helen Lawson tonight. She looked so lonely when we left her dressing room. Neely had wrinkled her nose. Listen, Helen never has a date. Tonight, she was lucky she had that faggot designer to take her to a party. Geez, Mel, your hotel is really chintzy. There's no heat, and it's practically morning. We get heat almost all night, she climbed into bed and shivered in his arms. All right, name the day and I'll move. We can get married any time you like. I'll find us a nice apartment. Neely had snuggled up to him, wrapping her legs around for his for warmth. How about it, Neely? You heard Johnny tonight. I'm sad. I'm making 200 a week. So am I. Then let's get married. Okay, on June 1st. Why do we have to wait until then? Because I got the apartment with the girls till then. 
I have to keep kicking in my third of the rent if I left before we all agreed to that kind of a deal because we're all on verge of getting married. We can manage it. We'll pay them. Are you kidding? I should pay two rents. But Neely, I want you, she giggled. You've, you've got me. Come on, take me now. But Neely, we'll get married June 1st. Come on, come on, Mel, make love to me. No, not that way. I'm not wearing any diaphragm. Do it the other way, please, Mel. February 1946. Anne and Jennifer stared in speechless disbelief as Neely casually directed the moving men in placement of an enormous piano. I've just signed with Johnson Harris office, Neely announced. What happened to Henry? Anne asked. Well, he had a long talk. We had a long talk yesterday. Yesterday, I told him Johnson Harris office had come to me and gave me a release right away. I'm not really big enough for a manager. I need a big agency behind me. Henry agreed, and look what happened. They gave you a piano, Jennifer asked. No, but they're paying for the rental, and they got me into La Rouge. I open in three weeks. But you're in hit the sky, Anne said. I'm going to double. I'll just do a midnight show at La Rouge, and for that I'll get 300 a week. Isn't that terrific? And guess what? The Johnson Harris office got me Zeke White. And they're paying for him, and he's going to make many my arrangements and stage my act. Zeke only works with the biggest stars. When he heard me sing, he said, with a little work, I could be great. He said, I'm a cross between Judy Garland and Mary Martin. Well, just don't let any Helen Lawson creep in, or we'll throw all three of you out, Jennifer said with a wink at Anne. Isn't the piano gorgeous? Neely asked, running her hand lovingly across the sky the scarred Steinway. Zeke insisted on this one. It does something for the room, doesn't it? Jennifer nodded. Sure does. Give it a real air like a rehearsal hall. Neely's childish face looked chagrined. Gee, do you mind it being here? Jennifer smiled. No. I'm just wondering where you plan to put the ballet bar. That does come next, doesn't it? Anne laughed. Let her, ambitious, let her be ambitious, Jen. It'll be nice having a star in the family. Neely made a wry face. I'm doing it strictly for the money. In June, me and Mel, when I get married, I want to have enough cash saved to furnish a place as nice as this. When does he get a chance to write for Johnny Mallon? Jennifer asked. He seems to be working full time as a press agent for you. I've never seen anyone get so much publicity. Why shouldn't he? Neely insisted. After all, everything I earn is for our future. You really don't care about making it? The star bit, Jennifer asked. For what? To wind up alone in New Year's Eve with some faggot as a date? Oh, I'll keep working after I'm married, but my marriage will always come first. And you're a fine one to talk. Don't you just turn down a contract at 20th because of Tony? Jennifer shrugged. It wasn't a good contract. Only 150 a week. But Henry thought you should have taken it, Neely insisted. If it had been bigger, would you have signed? Maybe, I guess so, but I have no talent, Neely. And you have? Yeah, but it takes more than talent. Hey, let's clean up this place. Zeke will be here any minute. It's, a neat, it's as neat as a pen, Anne insisted. Neely ran around emptying ashtrays. Jen, you use every ashtray in the place. Zeke says he's glad I don't smoke. Even in a room, smoke hurts his singer's voice. Jennifer raised her eyebrows. Will cigarettes be barred at your club opening? No, but why do I have to have my home contaminated? For the next three weeks, Jeek White took over the apartment. He rehearsed Neely relentlessly. Anne and Jennifer never arrived without finding him there. He was femininely attractive, aware of his own importance, a hard taskmaster, and an excellent music musician. He drove Neely unmercifully. What does he want from me, she demanded, bursting into the bedroom in tears. I never had a singing lesson in my life, and I'm doing okay. All of a sudden, he's trying to turn me into lily ponds. In three weeks, Anne, go in and tell him to get off my back. Then Zeke would appear at the doorway. Okay, Neely, hysterical time over. Let's get back to work. I can't, she would sob. You expect too much. Um, of course I do. Why be good if you can be great? Neely would always go back. The scales would continue, and there would be more hysterics, more scales. It seemed endless. But the loudest argument came at the end of the second week. Neely came tearing into the offices of Bellamy and Bellows 
Where is he? She demanded of Anne. Where's who? Henry. I want him back as my manager. I need him. He's got to get Zeke off my back. Henry's at NBC. What's Zeke done now? He wants me to burn all my clothes. What? You heard me. Burn them. He says he won't even let me give them away. They're so awful, including this new coat. He struck. She stroked the red fox collar lovingly. I paid $70 for it at Orbox. Anne hid a smile. Well, the coat is a little sophisticated for you. Look, all my life I've worn my sister's hand-me-downs. I have a right to pick my own clothes now. What does Zeke want you to wear? Who knows? I'm supposed to meet him later at some designer's place. That's why I need Henry to talk to him, to tell him I have some rights. Now, Neely, you don't need Henry. You can tell him yourself. No, I don't want to fight with him. He might walk out. Geez, Anne, he's done such great things with my boys. Sometimes I don't even believe it's me. And in just two weeks, you know, for the first time, I feel maybe I could be great. I can hit high notes I never dreamed existed and hold them with real power. He's a genius. Then maybe he's right about the clothes, Neely sighed. Well, I'm going to let him pick my dress for the opening. It's being specially designed because he's making me dance and move a little on some numbers, but I'll never give up this coat. The following week, she sent the coat to her sister, along with the purple, purple taffeta and the six new dresses she had bought since the show opened. Zeke made her buy an evening dress for the opening, two wool street dresses for every day, and a tailored navy blue coat. She stared at her sparse wardrobe in disgust. She alternated the two dresses, afraid to eat when she wore them. One spot in half her wardrobe was out of commission. Imagine, 120 bucks for, 25 bucks for this, she told Mel, as she spread a napkin carefully over the blue wool. They were sitting in Sardi's, where Neely now rent, raided a front table. In fact, that never ceased to amaze her. It's smart looking, Mel said, but it doesn't look like that kind of money. Zeke says, I have to create an image and look the way all look at look that way all the time. What kind of image is this dress supposed to create? She shrugged. I don't know. What does it do to you? You went to college. Mel bit into his sandwich and stared thoughtfully at the dress. Well, you don't look like a rising young Broadway star, that's for sure. He studied her more like a schoolgirl. Yes, that's it. Like maybe you're fresh from the fancy girls' college. Is that good? I don't know, honey. I love you in anything, even that awful purple job. Mel, you never told me you didn't like that taffeta. You had it when we first met, and I didn't want to hurt your feelings. What about my black coat with the red fox collar? Well, it was ordinary looking and sort of old for you. And this plain navy coat is unusual. I don't know, honey, but I think it's right for you. Fags have plenty of good taste. All right, she sighed and bit carefully into her sandwich. March 1946. No one was prepared for the impact of Neely's opening night. Anne was there with Leon and Henry. Jennifer sat across the room at a large table with Tony Poehler. His sister, his writers, and some song plug pluggers. Helen Lawson arrived with an assistant stage manager. She waved hello to Henry and pointed in, pointedly ignored Anne. It began as a typical, typical club opening. The newspapers came because it was an assignment. The celebrities came to be seen by the newspaper men. No one expected very much. It had happened before. A new little girl using the handle of a hit show to augment her slim pay, paycheck. They came respecting her energy and ambition. They left a raving and worshiping cult. Anne couldn't believe it. She caught Jennifer's eye during the show. They exchanged stares of delight, amazement. Henry Bellamy was sitting on the edge of, the, of his seat. Neely was fantastic. The lighting made the childlike face almost beautiful. And the dress, a plain white satin shirt waist and a short navy satin skirt, showed off her marvelous legs. Anne was surprised she had never noticed them before or the perfect little figure with its small waistline and childish breasts. The star that got away, Henry whispered, Jesus, Leon, how did we ever let her slip through our fingers? Leon shook his head. When we make a mistake, it's a beaut. She's really great, isn't she? Anne whispered. Great isn't the word, Leon answered. She's unbelievable. There's no one around like her. 
After that, the excitement that generated around Neely made life chaotic at the apartment. The phone rang constantly, and the living room was taken over for interviews, picture sessions, rehearsals. Neely had guest shots on all the radio shows. She signed with a major record company. Metro wanted her, 20th wanted her, and Helen Lawson stopped talking to her. Neely felt awful. Imagine, she just cuts me dead, she told Anne. Jennifer grinned. That means you're a star. She's still adorable to me. I was going to stay with the show until next season, Neely explained, but I won't now. Gilbert Case offered me a new contract starting June 1st with a bigger billing and a $100 raise, but I can't work with Helen when Helen treats me like this. Anne laughed. Come on, Neely. You have no scenes together. You're just salving your con conscience about leaving the show June 1st. Why should I feel I owe Case anything? I'd have never got the job if it wasn't for you, Anne, and if Helen hadn't been scared of Terry King. She finally sighed, signed with Century Productions. It's a smaller studio with the other, than the others, she explained, but the Johnson Harris office thinks it's best for me. Two of their pictures went up for Academy Awards last year. They're getting all the new stars, and I'll get the real star build up. Mel wasn't happy about her picture deal, but it's wonderful, she insisted. I stay with the show till the last day of May. Adele wrote and says she's coming back the middle of June and wants the apartment back anyway. So what about Jennifer and Anne, Mel asked. Well, if the sky will run another year, Jennifer will stay in until she marries Tony. Though nothing seems to be happening that way. They just date, no marriage talk. But where will they live? Oh, things are easier now. They might move to the Oren Hotel temporarily. They can get a suite there fairly reasonably. And what about us? We'll get married June 1st like we planned, Mel smiled. Gee, I thought you'd never ask. She squeezed his hand. Then we'll go right to California for our honeymoon. The head is getting me a house. The head? Oh, I forgot to tell you about him, Neely babbled. He was in town last week, Cyril H. Bean. But no one ever calls him Cyril or Mr. Bean. He's called the head. He's a sweet little old man, about 50, real tan and nice white hair. He's so kind and real fatherly. He's renting me a great house for me in Hollywood, 300 a month with a swimming pool. Only he told me not dare get in the sun because I got enough freckles. Then he said, if things go great and I make it, I can get a house in Beverly Hills. Who's, what's the difference? Who knows? Maybe it's the wrong side of the street. He kind of apologized about the house being in Hollywood. I pretended I understood, but imagine Mel. A house with a pool. Neely Mel reached out and took her hand. You know I love you. And Mel, I start at 1000 a week. Just think of all the money we're going to have. Neely, the Johnny Mallon show, comes from New York. Give it up. Just like that? Mel, are you crazy? You're only making 200 a week. I'll make three starting next year. But I'll be making 1000 and that doesn't count the money from records. The Johnson Harris office said I'll make 25,000 just on records alone next year. Imagine. And what do I do? Sit in a swimming pool? Mel, you're with me. We're a team. I need you. I need all the publicity I can get more than ever now. The studio will assign someone to you. Sure they will, but it won't be like you. Their press agent will take care of me and all the other stars. I want you to work for me alone. And Mel, you'll have to handle all the money. I never ever wrote a check in my life. Even in the apartment with the girls, they tell me what my end is and I hand it to them in cash. And geez, I wouldn't know what to say to, our maid, to a maid or a cook or even to hire them. I never had a house. You'll handle everything, Mel. You've got to come. I'd be nothing out there without you. No, Neely, it wouldn't work. Why? You're responsible for all this anyway. How did I get La, Ra La Rouge in the first place? The Johnson Harris office booked it. Mel, but Mel, the Johnson Harris office only got inter interested in me because of all the publicity you got for me. They didn't rush and sign me after I opened and hit the sky. Maybe I wasn't the singer I am today. Zeke did all that, but you got me noticed. He took her hand. Zeke didn't give you your voice, and I didn't make you. It was there all the time. You just happened to draw attention to it. Then keep helping me, Mel. I need you. I love you. But Neely, I don't know where whether it could work. I've never been to Hollywood. 
but I know they offer, I know how they operate out there. I'll be Mr. Neely O'Hare and no one would respect me. You don't think I'm going to be one of those fancy Hollywood parties or mix with those people, do you? I'll be just like, it'll be just like here. I get telegrams all the time to go to openings and sometimes we go. They don't call you Mr. O'Hara. It's different here, Neely. But we're the same. Look, Mel, I want to work hard, make money, and maybe in five years check the whole thing. Everyone will know you're responsible for me. Please, Mel, I won't go unless you come with me. Come with me. Now, Neely. Mel, please. He reached over and pressed her hand. All right, I'll always dreamed of having Hollywood tan. Boy, will I impress everyone in Brooklyn. Oh, my goodness. Now we're back to Jennifer, December 1946. Jennifer stood on a chair and tried to shove the hat box on, top, on the top shelf of the closet, then ducked as two suitcases fell, just missing her head. She groaned. The closet situation is really impossible. Anne helped stow the suitcases back on the shelf. I'll offer you my closet, but it's filled with your hand-me-down. How does a hotel expect anyone to live with just two small dinky closets? Why couldn't Adele have found some big English lord and stayed in London? God, how I miss that apartment. These are print, pretty large closets, Jen. It's just that no one is supposed to have all these clothes. And I hate them all. Jen, don't you dare buy another dress. I have the best wardrobe in town already because you get tired of something the second you've worn it. Leon's eyes pop the way... I keep turning up in new creations. Well, if Tony gives me a new wink for Christmas, you're, making, you're taking my old one. Old one? You just got it last year. I hate it. It reminds me of the prince. Besides, it, it's a mink, a wild mink. I would do, it would look great with your hair. I want a real dark one. I'll buy it from you then. Don't be silly. I have money, Jen. Henry invested the ring money plus 12000 how are you doing? Well, the only, we only got 20000 for the ring. It's worth more, but they said it wasn't a seller's market. And Henry invested it all in AT&T. It hasn't gone up too much, but I get a very nice dividend. Well, don't touch your stock. You're a fine one to talk. You've got pictures in Vogue, Harper's this month, and you haven't saved a cent. Honest, Jen, you must earn a fortune since you signed with the Longworth Agency, but you spend it all in clothes. It would be different. If you cared about them, between clothes and sending my mother money, how can I save? The modeling brings in three or four hundred a week, but that's not a real money. No, my jackpot is Tony. I'm 26, Anne. I haven't that kind of time for, or future. Tony is impressed with my clothes, and the newspapers call me glamorous. I think about this as an investment. I'm putting all my money on the line and rolling the dice for Tony. If the number comes up marriage, I'll be independent for life. That's still no reason to give away your main coat. Everyone's seen me in it for over a year, and if I look, if I marry Tony, I'll have a dozen. And unless Leon, Leon's book isn't a freak bestseller, you'll wait a long time for a mink. Well, I'm keeping everything crossed. He's finished it. He finished it last week. Wonderful. Now you get to get married. Anne laughed. It. It's not that simple. First, it has to be accepted by a publisher. He gave it to Bess Wilson. She's a very important literary agent. If she likes it and agrees to handle it, he's halfway home. A publisher will be automatically read a manuscript with more interest if, it gets, if he gets it from Bess Wilson. When will he know? Any day now. He's hoping to hear before Christmas. Hey, Neely, stop. Anne rushed to the record player and pushed the needle forward. You've worn out that album, Jennifer said. It's so great. I'm so proud of her. I can't wait for the picture to come out. Jennifer slammed the closet shut. Mind if I turned it off now? I want to read. Anne turned off the record player. Jen, it's two o'clock. We should both go to sleep. Will you? Uh, will my nightlight bother you? No, it just bothers me that you get so little sleep. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and your bed is empty. I go into the living room and smoke so as not to bother you. What is it, Jen? Tony? Jennifer shrugged. In a way, but I haven't been sleeping for over a year. I'm upset about Tony, though. In February, he goes to California to start a radio show. Maybe he'll ask you to marry him before he leaves. Not as long as Miriam is around. 
When we're alone, I can make them do almost anything, but we're only alone in bed. I can't very well have justice of the peace hiding under the sheets. What about eloping? I've thought about that. There's always Marilyn, but it's not that simple. In bed, he promises everything. In bed, he'll promise anything, but the moment he gets out of bed, he listens to Miriam. She started for the bathroom. Now go to sleep. No use both of us worry you. I'll think about something. I'll think of something. Try sleeping for a change, Anne said as she patted her pillow into shape. I'll give it a whirl, but first I have to do my exercises and oil up my equipment. Jennifer closed the bathroom door and wearily took out the cocoa butter. She looked at her face under the harsh bathroom light. A few tiny lines were forming under her eyes. In four years, she'd be 30. Hit the sky would go until June, but she had been a in it for a year, nothing was going to happen. Of course, there was always the stock contract at 20th, but if she took it and followed Tony to the coast, she'd never get him. And if he went without her, would he miss her enough to send for her? Not a chance. Miriam would see to that. He was flooded with beautiful girls, beautiful young girls. Sure, Tony thought he was 20, but once he saw a girl who was really 19 or 20, she might look a little beat. Miriam had been staring at her lately, asking funny questions, trying to trip her with dates about school. Thank God Tony wasn't too bright. She stopped suddenly. It was true. Tony wasn't too bright. Or was it just that Miriam took over so much that he never had a chance? He certainly was bright about performing. He knew if the music was off, even a fraction. No, he was just that, just that Miriam never gave him a chance to think. Miriam. She rubbed more than oil under her. She rubbed more oil under her eyes. She had to sleep. She returned to the bedroom. Anne was almost asleep. She got into bed and turned off the light. An hour later, she was still wide awake. This was going to be another of those nights. She got out of bed quiet, uh, quietly and went into the living room. She could sleep. If she could sleep, if she had the nerve, she went to her bag and took out the small bottle. She stared at the tiny bullet-shaped red capsules Irma had given them to her last night. Just take one and you'll sleep for hours. Second alls, Irma had given her four. They're like gold to me. I can't give you any more. Irma had replaced Neely in the show. She claimed the little red dolls had saved her life. I'd give you more, Jennifer, but you need a doctor's prescription. I can only get ten a week. Should she try one? It was a frightening idea that a little red pill as tiny as this could put you to sleep. She walked into the small pantry and poured a glass of water. She held the pill for a second, feeling her heart pound. This was dope, but that was ridiculous. Irma took one every night, and she was fine. Irma had been nervous getting into the show, and she was still nervous seven months later. I feel everyone is comparing me with Neely when I sing. She has such a big following with her albums now. Well, one pill couldn't hurt. She swallowed it and placed the bottle in her bag and rushed into bed. How long would it take? She still felt wide awake. She could hear Anne's even breathing and the clock on the night table ticking, the traffic sounds outside. In fact, everything seemed intensified. Then she felt it. Oh, God, it was glorious. Her whole body felt weightless. Her head was heavy, yet light as air. She was going to sleep, sleep. Oh, the beautiful little red doll. The following day, she visited Henry's doctor. He turned her down cold. She was in excellent condition. What was this nonsense? No, he would not give her a prescription for second all. Stop drinking all that coffee. Cut down on cigarettes. She'd sleep if she didn't. Then her body didn't need it. That isn't the way to do it, Irma explained a few days later. You can go to a good doctor and just come out and ask for them. It's best to find a little doctor, one whose ethics are a little shady. But where, Irma? I slept four nights in a row with those with blessed red dolls, and it was heavenly. I haven't slept in two nights without them. Look, for one of those third-rate hotels on the west side, you'll see a doctor sign on a dirty window, Irma explained. But don't just walk in and ask for pills. You have to play the game. Walk in and say you're from out of town. California is always good. Don't wear the mink or the rates will go up. 
tell him you can't sleep. He'll make a stab at listening to your heart, and you'll keep saying you need is a few nights sleep. Then he'll charge you 10 bucks and give you a prescription for a week's supply, knowing you'll be back. And he knows he's good for 10 bucks a week. But believe me, it's worth it. You may have to try a few doctors before you hit the right one. Two turn me down, but you'll find one. Don't go to the Mackley Hotel. That's mine. He might get suspicious. Jennifer found her doctor on West 48th Street. She knew he was the right one when he disinterestedly dragged out a dust, dusty stethoscope and made a half-hearted attempt to feel her pulse. Sure enough, she pulled out, he pulled out his prescription blank. Nembutals, or secondals, he asked. The red ones, Jennifer mumbled. Here's a week's supply of secondals, he handed her the prescription. This should straighten you out. If not, come by again. Anne was delighted at the change in Jennifer. She knew nothing about pills, but she was pleased to see Jennifer sleeping through the night. She wondered if Tony had dropped any encouraging hints. Then a few days before Christmas, as Anne was packing a bag for her usual weekend at Leon's, Jennifer made her big decision. This is it, she announced. I'm going to get Tony to drive to Elkton tonight or never see him again. I figured it out last night. If it doesn't work, at least I'll have six weeks going for me. Six weeks that he's in town where I can show up places looking divine with some other guy and drive him crazy. Crazy enough to relent and marry me. If I wait till he goes to the coast, I'll be dead. Where's Miriam tonight? Where she always is with us. There's a new show opening at Lombombra. I've told Tony I'm going home from the theater to change and pick me up here. Miriam will be waiting at Lombombra with his group. I'll have him alone and take him by surprise. And if I play it right, dot, dot, dot. My goodness. So we'll stop there. That's the end of this section. That's page 218. Valley of the Dolls. This is so crazy. Wow, what a page turner. Wow, and for the 1940s to be living so progressively must have been just crazy. People didn't live like they live today. And that's just wonderful. And I'm so glad that you're with me today. Here is my shout out as my fan. My little fan. I'm hoping that these will show back up in the stores because. I need another one. The other one died. The motor blew out, and I need another one because I like to keep one in the kitchen, and then I keep one in the bedroom. So I only have one, but I'll get another. They'll come back in the store. And this is my product placement. This is my thing of barrettes. These are so useful. Look, I, I'm, you just bend it, and it opens up. It's bend and snap like in Legally Blonde, and then you snap it in your hair. There we go. That's it. And uh, that's that. And I have sad news. The Dollar Tree, I went there a little while ago to buy a bunch of crap made in China. But anyway, I went there and the, the cashier said that that store is closing and there's not another Dollar Tree anywhere near me. I don't know where the next one is. It's not walking distance. So anyway, that's the end of the Dollar Tree. I guess this whole China thing is blowing up in their faces. I mean, it is all crap from China, but sometimes you have to go there to get something that that's really only worth a dollar. I had to buy little birthday hats, but anyway, we'll find out. I wonder what's going to go in that location. Maybe something more useful or, or better. I don't know. But anyway, we'll find out. <laughs> and have a great day. Let me know that you were here so I can visit your channel and watch your videos because I love to watch your videos. So give me a kiss. Have a good day.